today I've got a really nice trigonometry problem built out of a well-known identity. So our goal is to find all integers in such that cosine of 2x equals the nth power of cosine of x minus the nth power of sine of x. And this must hold for all x in real numbers. Okay, so let's get started. What I'd like to first notice is that there's a very simple case of this that's a well-known identity like I pointed out before. Let's take the n equals 2 case and notice here we have cosine of 2x equals cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. And of course this is true, so I'll put a check mark next to it. So the value of n equals 2 does produce this identity. But the question is, is this the only value of n that produces this identity? Well, in fact, we can create another one very quickly by multiplying both sides of this equation by 1. But we'll multiply by a different version of 1 on either side of the equation. So let's say this blue arrow is our multiplication by the number 1. Over here on the left-hand side, we'll simply multiply by 1, which doesn't change anything. And over here on the right-hand side, we'll multiply by cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x. So your favorite Pythagorean trig identity. So let's see. Multiplying the left-hand side will obviously give us cosine of 2x. And then using the difference of squares factorization formula, we'll have cosine to the fourth x minus sine to the fourth x. So that means that n equals 4 also is a solution here. In other words, n equals 4 makes this identity true. And now we could speculate that these are the only two values because these are the most obvious two values. But there's a bit of work to do to show that these are, in fact, the only values. For example, a priori, without looking at it too much, we could have negative integer values, like perhaps cosine of 2x is the same thing as cosine to the negative 5x minus sine to the negative 5x. Maybe that works. But what we'll see is that none of those other values work, and in fact, n equals 2 and n equals 4 are our only solutions. Okay, so let's get started. So our main tool here will be to use the fact that this has to hold for all values of x. And so what we'll do is take x to be a couple of different numbers and restrict ourselves down all the way to 2 and 4, which we've already checked works. Okay, so let's maybe start with x equals pi, and let's see what we get out of that. So that's going to give us cosine of 2 pi over here on the left-hand side equals cosine evaluated at pi to the nth power minus sine evaluated at pi to the nth power. But you could probably see something problematic occurring right there. And that is that sine of pi is zero, so this is in fact zero to the n power. But the fact that that's zero to the n power means that n must in fact be bigger than or equal to zero. So actually we need n to be bigger than or equal to one because this isn't super well defined at n equals zero. Maybe you could look at that case on your own if you wanted to. Like the n equals zero case just collapses this left-hand side to 1 minus 1, which is 0, or this right-hand side, I should say. Okay, so anyway, we know that n has to be positive. Now let's see what happens to the rest of this equation under this substitution. So cosine of 2 pi is equal to the number 1, given that cosine is 2 pi periodic and cosine of 0 is 1. And then cosine of pi is negative 1. But here we have 1 is equal to negative 1 to the nth power, which means n is in fact an even number. Okay, but if n is even, we can rewrite n as 2 times m, where m is an integer which is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, nice. But now let's plug that back into our original equation and see what we get. So that'll give us cosine evaluated at 2x 
equals the two nth power of cosine minus the two nth power of sine. Okay. Now from here, I'll take the derivative of both sides. So if this is a true equation, then we should be able to take the derivative and produce another true equation. So let's do that and see what happens. So let's say this magenta colored arrow means take the derivative. So let's see, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, but I have to use the chain rule that brings a two out. That gives me minus two sine of two x. And then over here on the right hand side, I have to use the chain rule. So this will give me minus 2m times cosine 2m minus 1 of x times sine of x. So that's from using the chain rule on cosine. Notice the derivative of cosine is sine. This 2m came down just again by the chain rule. Now let's see what we have over there. That will give us minus 2m times sine to the 2m minus 1 of x times cosine of x. There we're using the fact that the derivative of sine is cosine. But check it out, we can cancel minus signs out everywhere and we can also cancel twos out everywhere. So this minus will change to a plus, this two will cancel, minus to a plus, this two will cancel, and then the same thing right there. Okay, so that leaves us with something like this. We have sine evaluated at 2x is equal to, well, I can in fact factor a cosine times sine out of this right-hand side. So that gives me cosine of x times sine of x. And then I'll have cosine to the 2m minus 2x plus sine to the 2m minus 2 of x when all is said and done. Oh, and I just realized I forgot my m, which was out in front of the whole thing. Because of course, we've got a factor of m in front of both of these terms. Okay, so let's bring this up and we can finish it off. On the previous board, we derived that if this equation, our goal equation, was satisfied, then the following equation was satisfied. So we have sine of 2x equals m cosine of x sine of x times the sum of the 2m minus second powers of sine and cosine. Now, we'll evaluate it in, at another specific value of x. And the trick is to choose which value of x will be most helpful. Notice any real number is on the table here. So I think I'll take pi over four, and that's because sine of two times pi over four is sine of pi over two, which is a nice number. In fact, it's equal to one. And then cosine and sine evaluated at pi over four are both one over the square root of two. So that's also fairly nice. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say this arrow means we're evaluating at x equals pi over four. So like I said, sine of pi over two is one, and then we'll have m times, so cosine of pi over four and sine of pi over four are both one over the square root of two. So one over the square root of two times one over the square root of two is one over two or one half. So we get something like that. And then here we have an even power, so the square root will be canceled and we'll just half the power. So this will give us one over two to the m minus one, and then plus one over two to the m minus one again. Okay, but notice we're taking half the sum of something with itself, so that just means we get one over two to the m minus one after all is said and done, obviously multiplied by m. So let's see, this simplifies to m over two to the m minus one. So that gives us the following equation. We have m equals two to the m minus one. But we know that this can only hold for a couple of values, and that's because we've got linear growth on the left-hand side, more generally polynomial growth, but we have exponential growth on the right-hand side, and we know exponential growth always wins in the end. Okay, so how could we show that this only gives us a few solutions? Well, maybe we'll notice what those solutions are first, and then we'll make some sort of inductive argument for why nothing works after that. Okay, so for instance, notice if we have m equals one, that satisfies this equation because we have one is equal to two to the zero. 
And then m equals two also satisfies this equation because we have two equals two to the first power. Okay, so there we've got two solutions. But notice since n was equal to two times m, those were our solutions over here. And we've already checked that in the end, those make this equation hold for all values x. Now we just need to show that these are the only solutions to our linear exponential equation. So let's maybe prove that with a claim. So let's make this claim. If m is bigger than or equal to three, then two to the m minus one is strictly bigger than m. But if it's strictly bigger than m, then it cannot be equal to m. Okay, so let's see how this goes. We will use induction. So for our induction hypothesis, we'll set m equal to three. And note that two to the three minus one, well that's two to the two, which is equal to the number four, which is clearly bigger than three. So our base case is satisfied. So now let's make an induction hypothesis. So we suppose for some k bigger than or equal to three, we have the statement holds, so two to the k minus one is strictly bigger than k. And then we need to look at the next case. So let's look at two to the k. Notice that's equal to two to the k plus one minus one, so that is in fact the next case. But that's equal to two times two to the k minus one we can apply our induction hypothesis to this bit that I'm underlining in this magenta color and see that this is bigger than two times k. But if k is bigger than or equal to three, two times k is most definitely strictly bigger than k plus one. I don't really think that anything has to be said for that. But then reading from the extreme left to right hand side of the equation, we show that we have indeed established the truth of this claim, meaning that these m values are the only solutions to this equation, but via our calculation, this equation had to hold for our original equation to hold. But we started the video with the n values associated to these two m values, giving us maybe our obvious solutions. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.